And so I'm going to go through this <coughs> well vision filters ILM. Again, it kind of gets us back to the basic theory of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So I may skip some of the stuff that's not in the module, but of course, make sure you read through it. Again, some of this is review right from first year and second. But obviously, I know you definitely would not be sharp or crisp on this material, so make sure you read the ILM. Yeah, I'm going to hit some of the big points here as to why we're talking about this prior to talking about uh, filtering. Okay, so again, resistors are one component of an electric circuit. Specific values of resistance are used to control current flow or divide voltage. So again, we saw that with our voltage divider here, if we have a total resistance, we could get a percentage of each resistor, and then we could find the volt drop across that. So if you need to split up voltage in an electronic circuit, you can use uh, resistor uh, resistors in series as well. So it talks about the two types, fixed and variable. Obviously fixed, that is what it is, variable, like a potentiometer. We can adjust it. So from zero to maximum, again, if this is a variable one, uh, called potentiometers, trimmers, and rheostats. When an electronic device has variable quantity, whether it is time, current, or speed, the variation is often accomplished with the potentiometer. So we're gonna see how we can have a resistor and a circuit with a capacitor and inductor, and by changing the value of resistance, we can change the time in which it uh, reaches to its voltage, and which we can take advantage of. So variable resistors are commonly represented by one of the following symbols. Uh, the middle lead of the three lead potent potentiometer, sorry, is called the wiper, and the resistance between the wiper and the other lead changes if the dial is turned. Okay, so what it's saying is basically it's going to change the value of resistance depending on where that wiper is at the time. Uh, ratings, uh, like most coal electrical devices, the manufacturer sets a resistor rating to a maximum power that can be used with the device. Again, okay, we don't want to exceed that or it would be at the expense of the device. So it would, uh, for testing or replacing, we need to know the power in watts, resistance in ohms, the tolerance, and the maximum voltage so that we can replace them safely. Power again, the rating is the maximum amount of power that a resistor can safely dissipate. They are difficult to label the power rating, so they are indicated by its size. The smaller resistor, the smaller the power rating. Higher power resistors are often wire wound, made from small gauge wire wrapped around a cylindrical core. Power rating is often marked on the case. Okay, so for the uh, for the larger ones, the resistance value okay, can be listed right on the um, resistor itself, again, if it's large enough. So this one says 10,000 ohms, 20 watts. Okay, and it just uses this chart here to say that it could be a shorthand here as well too. So they said any values less than 1,000 ohms, the R is used to indicate this decimal place. So it's this chart, side of the chart right here. So R22 is like 0 decimal 22. R2R2 is like 2.2. And again, this is below 1,000 ohms and we're using the letter instead of the decimal. When we get between a thousand and then, uh, so a kilo ohm and then a mega ohm, K is used in place of the decimal instead. And then when we're greater than one mega ohm, we use an M instead. Okay, so just another way to keep the shorthand on the uh, resistor itself if there's physically not a lot of room to write information on. Uh, the other thing they talk about with resistance is tolerance. Okay, so basically it's saying it's been labeled with a degree of tolerance or accuracy plus or minus 5% in this example because it's got 5% right there. So 3.3 ohms at 5% will just tell you that it falls between 3.135 and 3.465 ohms. So it's just giving you a value. Again, it's not exact. Um, and we saw that in our lab even when we... You can either read the resistor in our uh, rectifier boards or you can record it with your meter and you'll get a, an actual accurate reading. Okay, but that's what that uh, tolerance is like a range of uh, value. Um, the color coding, and this is if they're very small and don't have enough room to actually write any information on, they'll use color coding instead. General purpose resistors have two significant digits, so 
here's the first one, here's the second one, and this color is for the multiplier, and then we have a tolerance band as well too. The difference between general purpose and precision is just the addition of a third significant digit. Okay, other than that, they're the same. Here's the multiplier and the tolerance. Okay, so what do these colors mean? Well, if we go to this chart here, it's going to give you a significant digit that's attached to that color. Okay, so if this look at this general purpose one, if this was red and then blue, red is 2, blue is 6, so this would be 26, and then the multiplier is yellow, so 26,000 uh, is what it would be, okay, because we're going to use the um, multiplier on that, or 26, yeah. It, so the only difference is, too, is when, it, again, when they get into that three significant digits is if it's a precision resistor. So definitely make sure you know if you're getting asked a question if it's precision or general purpose. Then as a tolerance band, and we can come here and see what the percentage are of the tolerance. So silver is 10%, gold is 5%. Um, I did put this in here in first year. We kind of give you guys this to help you. Um, remember the way they go starting at zero and going to nine but take it for what it is uh, if you have another way of remembering or if it's uh, uh, easy to remember the order then by all means okay but we, you might have a couple questions on color code as well too but again here we are this is a general purpose one so we have two significant digits so the red the blue and then the multiplier is red so if we look back here again red is two Blue is 6, so that's where they're getting this. And then red is the multiplier, which would be times 100. Okay, And then gold is the plus or minus 5%. So this resistor has a rated value of 26 times 100, which is, that's not supposed to be a plus, that's supposed to be an equal, sorry, which is 2,600 ohms or 2.6 kilo ohms. The tolerance rating is 5%, so the value is between... 2470 ohms and 2730 ohms. Okay, so that's how you do the color coding. And you talk about resistors and electrical circuits. Basically, as soon as we turn the circuit on in a DC circuit, we're going to get a voltage maximum and a current maximum based on this value of voltage and the value of resistance. That's how we're going to get this value of current. If the voltage is decreased, then the current will decrease as well, too. Yeah, it's a pretty straightforward relationship because they are in phase with each other. Okay, so as my voltage is peaking, so is my resistive uh, current. And we've gone through this quite a bit, but it is in phase okay, with the voltage. So we have no difference between the resistive current and the resistive volt drop here. So wherever one goes, the other. There's no leader lag associated with this. So it starts talking about capacitors. So in AC circuits, you won't have them marked with polarity. DC, they're definitely polarity sensitive. If you hook up a DC capacitor uh, to an AC circuit, it will explode. Okay, because it's not meant to be reverse uh, polarity. And if you put it into AC, obviously the, um, the supply is switching polarity every alternation. So that would be at the expense of the capacitor for sure. Um, a base capacitor, again, has two leads, has two plates with a dielectric in between. So we don't actually get current flow through these. It looks like current flow because, the, especially in an AC circuit, because the capacitor is constantly charging and discharging as the polarity changes. So it looks like we have flow through the capacitor, but uh, we actually have flow from the capacitor uh, to one side or the other is what it is. Um, factors that affect capacitance, the area of the plates, the type of dielectric, and the distance between the plates as well, too. And again, so just read up on some of this stuff. I'm not going to um, kind of go word for word on this, so you can, it's, it's pretty easily understood in the ILM. Okay, again, we have different types of, there's paper capacitor, Again, this is just like thinking you could unroll this like a piece of paper, a roll of paper towel. And it would just have two thin pieces of paper with a dielectric in between and then rolled up in a nice tight package with its rating on it. Okay, it'd have to be marked for polarity if it was polarity sensitive. Have its rating in microfarads usually and its voltage rating. This is a plastic film. Again, very small. Um, they have mica capacitor construction. So that's just when we have multiple layers. So then we have foil 
mica, foil, mica, foil, mica. So we show how these are still attached to each end of here and then that mica would be that dielectric and this is what it would look like uh, stacked together. Uh, and then we have ceramic. These are ones we often see in electronic circuits. Um, again, still physically very small. Electrolytic ones, these are the, to my knowledge, these are the polarity sensitive ones. They, um, again, never hook up a uh, polarized electrolytic capacitor to an AC supply or it will explode. Okay, so definitely cautious of that. Okay, and this one is, is definitely polarity sensitive, so we have to watch for that. Tantalum, again, polarity sensitive. It's got its uh, ratings on there, very small in size. So lots of different types. Again, read through that. Um, capacitors and DC circuits. So we kind of talk about this. We talked about this quite a bit in second year. Now we won't get quite as in depth as we did then. Basically it's saying as soon as um, we switch this on, current is at a maximum. Okay, so here's my current wave. It starts out as, as a maximum, then current flow slows down to zero as the plates become fully charged. So as soon as it turns on, current's at a maximum, then slowly decays down to zero around that at five time constants. At the same time, the voltage is zero when it's first turned on, then builds up to a maximum as the plates get charged to the source. And whatever this source is, is what this capacitor is gonna to charge to. This is 24 volts, it will charge to 24 volts. Okay? But a DC circuit, it's only charging and then it's gonna stay there. The only way it will discharge is if we provide a load across for, from it. Okay? Or potentially if, if you're that load and you touch the leads, it would discharge through you. So we can see in this, current leads the voltage because it is maximum while the voltage is at zero. Okay? Again, it takes five time constants for the maximum current to read zero while well, at the same time it takes five time constants for the voltage to reach maximum. The equation for one time constant, so time here, again, there's five of them to, do, to a, reach one time constant is R times C. So this is our RC circuit. So we can see if these values of resistance or capacitance increase, it'll take longer for it to charge or discharge. If the values of RC decrease, it will take less time to reach there, so it'll discharge faster. We're going to take advantage of this in our electronic circuits. So again, we want to show that current is leading. So while voltage is at zero, current is at a maximum. Okay, so it just kind of reiterates that um, when we have a capacitive circuit, current is leading. Usually, again, we talk by 90 degrees. Okay, and that's what's showing right here. Okay, and we're going to use, again, use the, the advantages that a capacitor offers us and that time constant to... Uh, in our electronic circuits. So again, here's our current at zero, leading this capacitive voltage by 90 degrees. Potentially, if it's an RC circuit, we have that resistive portion as well too, which is gonna give us our, our total voltage. Okay, and again, that can discharge sooner or later depending on the values of these. Um, capacitor can be used as a coupling device to block DC and pass AC if placed in series. Uh, often electronics in electronic circuits, an AC signal is superimposed on a DC voltage. The figure above shows that there is a 1 volt 60 hertz AC signal riding on a 10 volt DC. Okay, so up here we have 10 volts up here, DC, and we're showing that sine wave riding on that. If the DC signal is not required, placing capacitor in series to the load can block it. After the capacitor has charged to the level uh, of 10 volts in this case, the load only sees the fluctuation caused by the AC portion of the signal. So when the capacitor is in series, it's gonna block that DC. It's gonna to charge to that DC level and just kind of hold it there and the load will not see it. Again, for this to discharge, we would put a load in parallel, not in series. Okay, so when it's in series, it's like blocking the DC and only allows the AC because the AC is switching polarity all the time, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so when we talk about that coupling mode too on our scope, that's what, exactly what's happening there. Again, testing capacitors, just want to make sure that we're replacing them with uh, the exact same type that we removed from the circuit. Um, again, make sure they're discharged before testing them with the meter because they can hold a charge. 
Um, I remember hearing an example in school of, when I was in school about a guy that was uh, fixing old appliances like uh, microwaves and they have huge capacitors in them and he had it unplugged and figured he was good to go and discharged um, a capacitor through his self and ended up killing him. So there is significant uh, uh, danger there when we're doing that. Okay, so we do have to make sure that those are drained. And there's code rules that uh, in section 26 that will tell us exactly how we have to do that based on the value of capacitance, the voltage, and all that kind of stuff as well. Okay, but your meter will have a check in the capacitor range, usually your multimeter, and you can check the value of capacitance for those as well too and compare them to the rating. Last thing to talk about is inductors. Again, different symbols. So here's with an error core, a variable, so we can see that arrow, and then an iron core with those two lines above it. Again, the factors that affect inductance are the number of turns, the type of core materials, and the cross-sectional area of the core as well, and then the length of the conductor as well. Okay, These are all, I think, number of turns directly proportional for sure. That goes up it goes up. Core material, the permeability, if it increases, the inductance increases. Cross-sectional area of larger core, uh, better inductance as well too. And there's just an example of an inductor there, which is a fan. Again, most of the loads we hook up are uh, inductors. Again, number of turns increases, permeability increases, cross-sectional area increases, and the length of the core increases. They're all gonna increase that uh, value of inductance. And then we talk about inductors in a DC circuit. They'll first talk about adding inductors in parallel and series. They did talk about that with capacitance too. I didn't mention it here. Um, again, it's in your ILM. Pretty straightforward. I've gone through that even in the review at the beginning of this year as well. Inductors in DC circuits. When an inductor is first connected to a DC circuit, the rate of change of the applied current causes an induced voltage almost equal to, but in opposite direction to the applied voltage. As the current builds and the rate of change decreases, the voltage decreases, okay? So when we first turn this on, our current is low at zero and our voltage is high. So we're gonna see the a, a high voltage then slowly decay down to zero, that's that CEMF. And then we're gonna see current start at zero and slowly build up. I associate in this instance, I try to associate current with the magnetic field where as soon as we turn the switch on, there's no magnetic field until it builds to a maximum and I associate current with that magnetic field. So the current continues to increase until the rate of change is zero and resulting voltage is zero. The voltage is maximum when current is zero, so current lags the voltage. Okay, so voltage is peak here and current is at zero. So we're seeing either voltage leading, but again, we usually talk about in reference to current, so current would be lagging this voltage. The formula for one time constant is an inverse relationship between inductance and resistance. So if resistance goes down, the time will go up. And if resistance go up, the time will go down because that inverse relationship with resistance and time in this formula, inductance is direct though. If inductance goes up, the time goes up. Inductance goes down, time goes down. They are gonna talk more about the capacitive circuit than the inductive coming up but it's good to talk about both. So again here we see voltage peaking with current at zero, so we'll say that current is lagging uh, voltage by, again, 90 degrees. So here's my current on my axis, here's my inductive voltage and the resistive portion that's in phase. Together they would add up to my uh, applied voltage, again, depending what's in the circuit, but if it is a uh, resistive and inductive circuit, they would add together to get your total voltage that way. And again, we would show current lagging as we were rotating counterclockwise around here. So how can we use inductors for filtering? So inductors are called choke coils because they suppress sudden rises in current. Again, the def definition of inductor is opposes a change in current. Capacitor it opposes a change in voltage. So it it um, suppresses sudden rises in current or impose it, okay? They also oppose a sudden decrease of current. So as the pulsating DC from the rectifier rises from zero to peak, 
it attempts to cause a sudden rise in current. So this pulsating DC here, it peaks, then it goes down, then it comes back up and peaks again. The choke coil opposes this with CMF and limits the current to a value less than what the peak would have been without the choke coil. So basically when it wants to start going down, the choke coil is going to put EMF back or CEMF back into the circuit and kind of create a little bit of a phase shift here as well too, but not allow it to go down as far as it would because it's like it's getting almost a separate supply from the load wheel from the choke filter and then basically catch it back on the peak from the rectifier or the DC supply and then see that peak again. Okay, so this is what it looks like with the filter. And again, you can see it, it shifted the peak a little bit off too as well. And then this is what it would look like with no filter. So we're definitely getting a bit of a smoother DC output with that filtering on there. Okay, so that's the whole point about that. So as the pulsating DC from the rectifier rises again, attempts to cause a sudden rise in current, the choke coil opposes this with CMF, limits the current to a value less than it would have been without the coil, choke coil. Then as the supply drops from, from peak to zero, it attempts to bring the load current down to zero. So this is attempting to bring the load current down here, down to zero. This is what the load would see is this peak and then zero. The inductor opposes the sudden drop in current and boosts the load current with CEMF to keep it from falling to zero. Okay, so as the load's gonna see this portion right here instead. Okay, so it's gonna see the addition of the pulsating DC supply, but now with the filter, it's gonna get a lot smoother output towards the load. Okay, and then when testing inductors, it does talk about inductive reactants as well too, but again, it's, uh, I would say uh, somewhat review for us. Again, replacing inductors, you can use your meter. If it's a set of windings that's broken, you would see um, OL, and then you would know that the, the coil that you're testing is broken and needs to be replaced. You could also read continuity, so a beep, but it should give you a, an ohmic value. And if you, if you would have, hopefully have an expected ohmic value that you were looking for, because even if the windings were melted and uh, kind of welded together, it would still make the um, inductor or the, this load not work properly, but would still give you continuity, but it would give you a different ohmic value. So if you knew what you were supposed to read, you could definitely compare. Okay, Oops, sorry. So now gets into talking about filters. So this is us putting them in circuits now to try and take advantage of their characteristics. So filters, when an AC voltage is rectified, the resultant DC voltage pulsates. Okay, so we saw this coming out of our rectification process already. Again, pulsating may be fine with some applications like battery chargers, like we saw, but other applications require smooth DC output with no ripple. Okay, so this is what they prefer to see. A nice smooth constant line, no ripple, so no peak, peak uh, to max and then down to zero. Filters are used on the output of the rectifiers to produce smooth DC power. So here's what I output out of my rectifier. I'm going to put some filters in here to try and get as close to this as possible. So a ripple. A variation in the magnitude of voltage is called ripple and is often referred to as the AC component of the voltage because it's still peaking and valleying. Figure 9 shows a waveform from two types of rectifiers and the ripple of each waveform. So use our single phase full wave bridge. So that's our percentage there, base times them by 10 volt. So this is what we'd see for a DC average. And then a three phase half wave, here's our percentage here again, because we have 10 volts. We'd be able to see that percentage quite clearly because we're using 10. Okay, but we're seeing that the ripple is larger for these half wave full wave, uh, sorry, these full single phase full wave as opposed to the three phase half wave. So rectified voltage also has a DC average voltage. So that's what we've been talking about. This is our DC average. You can find the ripple, percent ripple of an output by dividing the VRMS of the ripple. So this AC component of ripple, that has to be a measured value. Okay, we can't calculate the RMS of the ripple. Okay, we have to measure it with a meter and we'll do that in our welders lab as well. Then we can divide that by the VDC average, with it, which is our expected average. We can use our calculated values for, and we'll find the percent ripple. 
A filter with a low percent ripple has a smoother DC voltage than one with the high. Okay, so this would have a higher ripple than this. Again, a filter, if we could get low percent ripple, would have a smooth output and no peaks and valleys on it. So the first type of filter is capacitor filter. It's the simplest filter in the circuit. It consists of a capacitor connected in parallel with the output terminals of a rectifier and in parallel with the load. Okay, so here's our capacitor filter here, again, in parallel with the load. If we don't have a DC load hooked up to this, the capacitor will charge right to the peak of whatever the output is out of this rectifier and it will just sit there. So if you put a meter across that, you would actually read the peak because it has no place to discharge. So watch that. If you see a question where they have a capacitor filter in parallel and they say there's no load, what is your meter going to read? It's going to read peak because it's going to read that stored charge in that capacitor. Okay, but if there is a load hooked up, it's going to discharge into the load as well too. We'll talk about that here. So again, a capacitor poses a change in voltage. When the rectified voltage rises towards the maximum voltage, the capacitor is charged. So as we come up here like this, we're charging that capacitor to the same value, the same peak here. At V peak, the capacitor stops charging. And as the rectifier begins to decrease, so again, here we are at peak and the rectifier is starting to decrease, the capacitor opposes the drop and discharges energy into the circuit. The capacitor then discharges through the load, reducing the amount of ripple. So again, peaking here, charging, as the rectified voltage wants to decrease, well now we have a capacitor in parallel, so the capacitor is actually going to act as a voltage source now for the load. So the capacitor discharges and then catches the rectified voltage again, charges up to that peak, discharges, charges, discharges. Okay, again, because it's opposing that change in voltage. So what we end up is we get this, what they call a sawtooth waveform happening, and it's smoother, a lot smoother than just the unfiltered rectified voltage. So the amount of ripple the load sees depends on the capacitance of the capacitor and the resistance or impedance of the load. The greater the load or the lower the resistance, the faster the capacitor discharges, and the greater the amount of ripple. So if we don't want ripple, then we would obviously want to change that value. So with no load, the capacitor maintains the output voltage at peak value, which makes it a perfect filter. Okay, that's what I was talking about in that previous slide. If we don't have a load hooked up, that capacitor is gonna charge right to the peak and it's gonna stay there. So it will be look like a perfect filter because it's gonna basically have maximum DC voltage stored in it. And as soon as you put your meter across there, that's what you're going to read. Okay, so that constant charging and discharging back to the load helps smooth out that uh, DC ripple. Uh, the choke filters, again, this is an inductor, um, is an inductor that is used to filter the ripple voltage of a rectifier. The choke filter consists of an inductor coil connected in series, okay, instead of parallel, with the output of the rectifier and in series with the load. Okay, so again, here's our rectifier. So we have an output, and then we put a choke filter in series with the load. So there's some phase shift between the output voltage of the rectifier and the load voltage due to the inductor in the circuit. When the inductor opposes a change in current, it creates a reduced ripple at the load. The two factors that determine how well the choke filters the output are the inductance of the choke and the amount of current. Without a choke filter, a large load, again, less resistance, creates a greater variation from zero to the peak value of current. However, the choke coil opposes the change in current. It reacts more to a larger load than a smaller load because larger load tries to create a larger variation in current. So the filtering effect increases as the load increases. So again, we have our rectified voltage coming out of here. Then when we have a choke filter in series, here's that phase shift that we saw in that other example as well too. So we're kind of seeing, we won't see this quite this peak um, as, as high and then a valley as low. So we do still see um, a variation, but not near as much as what we saw. And big thing here is what this is saying is a choke filter ha virtually has no filtering effect when there is little or no load. So if there's no load on there, we would see no filtration. It's based on the load current that we'd actually see that. So these filters are better for high load uh, applications, larger loads, so if, uh, or sorry, larger ampacity. 
So then we would see um, more filtering effect. The L-section filter, this filter consists of a capacitor and a choke filter. They are effective over a wider range of loads. The capacitor proved good filtering at small loads, while the choke is more effective with larger loads. The capacitor also suppresses spikes produced by the choke coil when a load ch current changes rapidly. An L-section filter should always be connected with the capacitor across the output after the choke. Then this reduces the possibility of voltage spikes at the load produced by the choke. So this guy will eat up any of those voltage spikes before the load sees it. This filter is also called a choke input filter because the choke inputs into the capacitor. Okay, so that's the, got the two types of filtration and then together they are called an L section and then we're kind of reaping the benefits of both. So I think I'm just gonna keep going here. We're at half an hour, but um, this part of the module just kind of gets you into welders in, in general, okay? So it's definitely not a bad read if you don't know that a lot about welders. It talks about the difference between um, resistance welding, metal inert gas welding, gas metal arc welding, okay? And it basically will get you down into the um, components. We'll talk more about the rectification, okay? But you can have different types of units with 120 volts or 240 volt. This duty cycle of 20%, we're going to do code calculations for welders, and that's going to come into play for us for sure. Um, the main components, again, transformers, rectifiers, and the filters, so I'll identify those for you. But again, these machines need that nice, smooth DC output, so we do have filtration um, to get this as ripple-free as possible. Uh, so the first one they talk about is a 120 volt single phase uh, bridge rectifier welding machine. So it's 120 volt input, 130 amp DC output with a bridge rectifier. So I've gone and kind of circled this uh, from the module. So here's the transformer section, here's the bridge rectifier, and then here's the choke filter. This is would be the load here, the welding electrodes. Okay, so just go through and kind of have a look at all these different um, examples they give you just to kind of pick out the uh, in the schematic where you can see the transformer the rectification and the filter this one's a center tap so different than the bridge that we saw so here's a transformer then our center tap diodes here our rectification and then an L section filter here's the capacitor and here's the choke filter in series with the load and uh, again we normally would like to see this guy in parallel here to suppress these spikes coming from there, but obviously does not show that. Uh, 240 volt input welding machine, again, different type of rectification. So here's our transformer section. Um, again, we got our four diodes coming in here. So this would be what looks to be like a bridge. Here's our L section filtering here and looks to be a capacitor right here as well too. Then it just goes through and uh, tells you all the different uh, parts and such. Okay, so definitely have a read through that welder section. We will ask you some questions. Our questions are basically gonna say, it's either a bridge rectifier welding machine, it is a center tap, okay? So our questions will definitely get you uh, through the ringer on calculating the VDC and then uh, potentially talking about the filtration. Now, one thing to mention is that if, if I'm going through and looking at a waveform like this with a choke filter or this with a um, capacitor filter, this is my determined rectified voltage that I've calculated okay, based on those percentages. As soon as I add a filter in there, the wave is not the same. So I cannot calculate what that is. So I can't use the percentages if there's a filter. So if there's a filter on here, there's no way to know what the expected VDC is, okay? Just so we have an understanding there. Again, we can use the VDC to calculate this output out of a rectifier, but as soon as we add a filter into it, it changes what the load is gonna see. So we have no way of calculating that. The only thing we can calculate again is if we have a scenario where we don't have a load here and we calculate the peak because we know that's what that guy's gonna charge to. Okay, so 
go through that, have a read through the welding portion of it. Again, not too terrible, but uh, answer the questions, go through our blackboard and uh, we'll hook one of these up in lock.